Hey folks, sorry for a uh, slight delay. I am Trace Nelson, back at it. I've been uh, away for a couple of weeks, um, but I am so excited to be back on Black Food Folks for another conversation um, on my normal Friday um, slot this week. Um, have the amazing um, Chef Amaris Jones. Um, if you've been following on, you realize that they have some really extraordinary food programming now, um, original programming, and, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Nola. Um, and Amaris is featured on a program called Food Fantasies. So it's going to be so interesting to hear her talk about her story, um, her life in food up to this point, and her new show. Um, thinking really interestingly about... Um, so this wild fever dream just come up with. So let me see if I can find a Marys. This is going to be a good one. Hey, Cicely. Hey, hey. There you go. Hey. Hey, lady. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm really good. How you yeah. doing? Good. How are you? Really good. You look great. Thank you. So do you. It looks like we have similar backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I think so. The same plan. <laughs> you know, you know. Um, so I want to first say thank you so much for your time. I know you always super busy, so taking an hour of your day is, um, is a lot, and I appreciate your time. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I think a lot of us have been watching with a lot of, like, cautious optimism about the idea of mainstream spaces, um, thinking about food. And Owen has sort of um, stepped out and led in a lot of ways. And they launched last weekend um, for original programs. And Yours Food Fantasies is featuring a lot of chefs. Some we didn't know. Some, um, you know, chefs that we may have been familiar with for a long time. And I just love it so much. So I'm so glad to get a chance to talk to you. Thank you. I'm so excited about um, just new, this new launch that Owen's is doing just really, really celebrating black cooks and chefs from all over. Um, and something that you don't see quite often on mainstream TV. Um, so I think that their focus is just right on point right now and people are very excited about it. Yeah. So I want to I want to sort of put a pin in the show because if you are first of all if you haven't tuned in last week um with the launch and it was a solid two hour block of just interesting wide ranging kind of, um sort of programming so I'm put a pin and um we're gonna circle back to it but I would love it if you could talk a little bit about how you came to food because I know you're from Philly um you're living in Miami now but that sort of Philly food scene. I'm always interested when I'm talking to folks who um, kind of came up in Philadelphia because it's a, a wildly misunderstood and sort of underestimated food city, but it is really dope. Really dope. I mean, I grew up as a um, in, I was born in North Philly, North Philly and um, then we moved to the suburbs of Philly's area called um, Roslyn, Willow Grove area, which is like Northwest, past like Mount Airy, uptown. Um, but I, my daddy was a minister and like most of my food experience outside of my family was in the church. So my dad, he had his, one of the first black storefront churches in Philly. And, you know, I spent all my weekends in between South Philly and, and West Philly, my entire childhood and being on his church was on South street and it was called Southside church center. And being on that street, I was able to like experience this culture, just that, you know, the Italian market was like look around the corner and then um, the Jamaican places and just, you know, as a very, you know, I was introduced to a lot of different cuisines at a very young age, really expanded my palate. And Philly is just full of, just full of everything, full of everything. 
what do you think about because I wonder like I feel like in New York we can kind of see this uh, this influx of immigration where people think when they come here like it's just it's easy to sort of stay in and you think about like that sort of northeast corridor right like Washington D.C. is also a city that's sort of un underrepresented in terms of its sort of melting pot nature but I mean Philadelphia is one of those places where like Cuisine has been happening since the birth of the nation, and we forget it so often. Um, the birth of the nation. I mean, literally, you're right. I mean, I remember just experiencing as a little, like, there were restaurants and there were food halls everywhere. I remember going to a place called Father Divine's. And I, have you heard of Father Divine? Yes. He was like this peace mission leader, right? And he had these hotels, and he, he called these hotels Heavens. Um, but on the, the ground level, there was this huge cafeteria that he would serve the community. And I think the, the meals were like, I don't know, very cheap. They were like a dollar for like a full meal. And my father, we used to go there sometimes with my family. And I used to, just experiencing that, the community food um, experience, I mean, just was always just something that will always stay in my mind. Um, and you, they would serve everything. It was a lot of soul and Southern cuisine, but they would, one day it would be something special, be like an Italian dish or um, an Ethiopian dish. I mean, it was just very, very diverse at that place. I'll never forget it. And I remember sitting there and looking, cause it was like one long table and it'd be an empty chair and it'd be food sitting like a whole, like setting there with food on it and no one would ever sit in that chair. And I would go, mom, how come the food is just always just sitting there in that chair? And I said, because that's reserved for Father Divine. I think he's coming back. And he mm. <laughs> so it's, there was an Eater piece probably a year and a half, two years ago. So, um, they wrote about Father Divine and his, his work, right? And I think yeah. if, if somebody, ever, once you get off the head, you need to go and Google Father Divine and read that Eater piece. And sort of learn about his legacy, but what year would this have been? Because I think sometimes we think about him in, in his, he, he was married, he was a whole, there were multiple, there were people all across, like, especially all, up in, down, down to down Seaport, down. but like, yeah. All over New York, um, but, but I think about him like in the 60s, like the 50s, 60s, 70s, way, because the, the restaurants were made, I didn't, I forgot about that part, that they, they the well into the 80s. They were there for a very long time. So in addition to that, you know, it was going to, you know, you know, as I grew older and became a teenager and I kind of really got to like just jump on a bus and go wherever, I would, you know, end up at um, Lebec Bend, which was, you know, a really prestigious, um, very prestigious Michelin star um, restaurant. From there to like your, your typical um, soul food places that were like on the corners in all the different neighborhoods. Um, so, so cool. Like, I, cause that's, that's what I was trying to get. It just feels like you go from all these really sort of establishment, like, fine dining French restaurants to the cheesesteak side to the follow the vibe to the it is all kind of within the same it all existed in this really interesting way in Philadelphia. And it already did and I that in that introduction to all of those restaurants and like thank God my dad he had these relationships with like all these people from like all over the city and just all over the world actually and they were they come from different cultural backgrounds. So you know I just remember just eating at people's houses and um and just tasting just food from all over the, all over the world so and yeah. and they were all living in philly so if i remember this one restaurant that was in mount area it was called um garden of belial and it was a, a muslim soul food restaurant and they would sell and this was kind of like the influence a lot of the, my cooking is influenced by them as, as far as my my soul cooking even outside of you know my mother and my you know, my mom's side of the family, but they would, they wouldn't serve pork and they would, they would serve like smothered turkey chops and green, like all these, they had a huge vegetarian menu, huge vegetarian menu. And then they had the meat on the side, and, but it wasn't that much meat. Yeah. And that's another misconception with soul and Southern cuisine is like, it's extremely, you know, full of a lot of meat and fat and Traditionally, it's, actually, no. Yep. We raised on vegetables. 
So I would love it because, I mean, you talk about, you know, being a, a preacher's kid, being in this city that was so rich with food, but were you thinking about food when you were, like, going to college or sort of leaving Philadelphia and sort of thinking about what you wanted to do professionally? Was that on your radar? Not a, as, not professionally. I was just doing it just for the love because I love community. I would cook mm -hmm. for friends. People would come over, you know, once I graduated college, you know, I had my, got my own place, my first apartment, and people would just come over and, and I would just cook a bunch of food. And it was just always just, just for the love of it. And it never really dawned on me to like, to do it um, professionally. But above all, even when I was in college, though, I was, I was always kind of like the entertainer and always in, I knew that food, brought people together. So in college, you know, I got like a, a job like at the student union center and I would make these crazy, um, these turkey sandwiches that the whole school would come and get. Um, and it was like just a fun thing. So it was just something that I just love, but I never thought it would turn into um, a, a professional career. But you were, so you, you studied PR marketing or like what was a business? Communications. I had, I was a real TV film major. Um, I graduated from Lincoln University. I did a program in, at Temple University, Lincoln, the first HBCU. ATP. That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I graduated Lincoln and uh, from Lincoln and with that degree and ended up not working in my, my field at all. <laughs> Which is, I mean, That's so often, right? Like... Mm-hmm. Yep. So... So what? Do you, so what did you end up doing? Because I feel like there's the uh, this sound to me. It sounds like what it, what this sounds like is all of these tools that you picked up along the way that have served you, but maybe weren't you didn't weren't realizing or recognizing these tools back there, like they when it was being all in my subconscious, all in my. It was there. I just didn't know. You know, and it wasn't until probably like I you know prior after that I, I worked as a property manager and then. I got into real estate, worked for a real estate and investment trust company for a very long time um, doing that. And then I moved to South Florida and I started like a lifestyle management company and I started working with, you know, um, celebrities and like, kind of like managing their lives. Um, but it wasn't until during those, those tenures where I really kind of like realized, you know what, I have a real love for cooking. Because people, so what happens is I, they would have friends that would come in town, and I become friends with a lot of folks like in these industries, music and entertainment, and they would ask me, you know, we're here in Miami, where can we go and find some really good Southern soul food where you can sit and listen to some great music and and just just vibe. And at the time, there were some restaurants, but the, what they were describing, there was a void. There, there wasn't any. Um, and that's when it kind of like dawned on me, well, maybe I should start something. And that's kind of like how it happened. I ended up opening a restaurant and everyone who's anybody just just loved it. They, they came and they supported me and um, it was a really great experience. And that really, um, really started the career, you know. That I, and this you know, was I, South I went, Street. Yeah, it was called South Street. And I went in very unexperienced. I mean, I was a, a chef in, in at my house, you know, an official chef in my house, but it really didn't start until that restaurant opened. And then it transitioned to different things. So talk to me about Miami, because it feels like there's a kinetic kind of energy that happens in Miami, especially the South Florida in general. Like, like, I feel like Miami, sort of New Orleans, like, there are these cities where the vacation escape nature of them sort of create this energy. Um, and it's interesting when I talk to people who live in these places because the, the hot dog industry becomes so critical to making the mechanism of the city work in ways that I don't know that a lot of cities experience. Like, it's one thing to be in a city where you have a, a vibrant restaurant scene. It's another thing when the whole sort of framework of a city is predicated on hospitality and sort of sort of tourism nature of it. So mm -hmm. I would love if you could talk a little bit about sort of see because you again you talking about like or like two thousand what, two thousand twelve? So the restaurant opened in two thousand twelve. 
but prior to that, like when I got to Miami, which was like 2002, um, the scene was very much hanging out at like hotels, the lounges at hotels, or just going to the clubs. And I think as time progressed, people were like, okay, where are the really cool restaurants where we can just have like great entertainment? Um, like, I mean, there were some, but there weren't that many. And the ones that were there, they were like on Ocean Drive and they had, you know, like Mango's was like a great place people would go to and just, and watch the dancers and have great margaritas and the whole nine. But there, there wasn't like a soulful um, experience anywhere. Um, where someone could go in and hear like some live music or just listen mm -hmm. to some great music that they grew up on and just be kind of without going to the club, you know what I mean? So yep. that's what, what was really happening. But now, I mean, there's a lot of establishments that are actually have taken that direction to really, really. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I was because it just because I was it just made me think because it was just there was this feeling around you. I mean, I, you know, like. That's sort of two, the, the early 2000s, especially right before 2008 when the economy downturn. It was a yeah. sense of just possibility, especially for um for people of color. It was this, a chest of color. There was this idea that like you could create your own lane in this really interesting way where brands were sort of seeing this mm -hmm. void that was being left. And yeah. just something about the your story, just you were in the exact right place of literally the exact right, right time in the right community to sort of define what that looked like in, 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 in a city like Miami. Yeah, it was a real blessing. It was literally, people were coming from people that lived like an hour and a half away, like Palm Beach, they were just coming to Miami to visit South Street. And when I would talk to the patrons and, and ask them where they were from, I was just always blown away. And I'm like, why'd you drive all the way down here? I said, because of a vibe. You created a vibe. You created like a second home. It's something that we haven't seen in a while in South Florida um, that really caters to, you know, the soul, um, the feeling of being soulful and the soul connection and, and blackness and black food and celebrating our history, you know? So, yeah, it was, Ugh, it was so fun. Good. It was fun. Yeah. So, again, you, you sort of had this sort of, you were in community with this collection of creators, like black creators, black um, yeah. sort of celebrity culture that's the whole thing but like just in this you see, it feels like this you in this community with like there's so many interesting black creators who understood the power of what you were doing yeah. you open south street and it closes so what do you do after that because i feel like the where i've sort of seen your work and been most interested in is this sort of catering private chef personal chef kind of concierge nature to your work where it's Really, you define it really for, on your own terms how you show up in sort of the hospitality space. And so, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about starting that aspect of your business and what that looks like. Um, it was now very, because it's such an interesting it was, trajectory. It was so surprising because when I closed South Street, when it closed, you know, suddenly, which was really shocking, actually de very depressing for a long time. Um, I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to go back to lifestyle management and, and working with these clients again? Um, I started consulting and, and, and prior to Open South Street, I was consulting in, like for magazines and there's like the local TV um, company that I was doing some consulting for as well. But I was like, am I going to go back to that? And it wasn't until the restaurant closed, um, like after like maybe a month of it being closed, I started receiving calls from just people that were patrons. They were like, oh, would you do some catering? Could, we love your food. Can you just cater and deliver it to us? Or, you know, we're having this private party. Do you think you'd be able to do that? And that's kind of like how it organically started. You know, the restaurant was, you know, the stepping stool, but literally that's where it came from. And then I started getting calls from brands like Reebok. Reebok called me to help um, cook healthy meal plans for Rick Ross. And, and it, it just spend literally the sky was the limit i was getting calls anywhere and it was really unconventional because i did no advertising i did it was literally word of mouth and then i just started catering events all over south florida you know yeah i wanted to i really wanted to spend some time there because it i feel sometimes like we dismiss or sort of misunderstand the world of sort of that private chef that catering space like it just feels it's so 
empowering to set your own terms for the work you want to do. And it just also, I know so many chefs who are so brilliant and do such interesting work and feel so beholden to the structure of a restaurant. And I think this moment, especially in the midst of COVID, has sort of shown us the fragility of restaurants um, in terms of business model and the way yeah. you sort of tackle, um, still bring, a, I mean, I think the core of what you wanted to do as well was all about, I don't know, like the sort of celebration or sort of the, like the the lifestyle element of our right. industry. Is, right. And you don't have to do that. It actually is most interesting outside the context of a structured restaurant. Right. It's very interesting because then you can, you know, a lot of chefs are in these restaurants and, you know, I love my restaurants, but some of the restaurants are so, the corporate structures are just so like a Houston, for instance. You know, you have a chef that goes in there, they have to follow everything by the book. It's very, very corporate. And the beautiful thing about the personal chef and the catering aspect is you really, really can dive in and get your creative skills on seriously and do what you want to do and present it to folks and have folks taste your food and understand like where you're coming from. Um, and the whole personal chef thing, it's, you know, you can glamorize it and make it, a bit, it's a very prestigious thing to do. You know, it literally, I mean, I, I think it was my mom. She was like, oh, you're not going to be anyone's server or you know, she mm. like, you know, get into that space because it kind of like she's like, oh, I don't want you to be the help at, you know, working for somebody. And I'm like, well, interesting. You, know, you can. It depends, and you also have to be careful on the client that you pick. You know, it depends That's on what their mentality is. You know, you don't want to go in, but it's it's very much. I've never had that experience um, where someone is, you know, wanted to treat me in that way. You yes. know. That's that's so interesting because also I think that 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 narrative as well around like that's the mass exodus in this sort of, sort of late sixties early seventies right like we, we used yeah. to be we used to dominate this industry we were we were the whole little workforce in this industry and sort of this ability this sort of exodus from service um, was sort of a civil right right and so this right. I, so so many people's parents wanted so much for us and didn't mm -hmm. see the power and the value and the, the earning potential and sort of professional landscape of this work had the uh, same kind of my mother wasn't sort of she wasn't she wasn't she wasn't unsure about the service part of it i think that she just didn't see it didn't understand how broad and she was right that, that's so interesting this 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 idea of service right but even if you aren't in a private home the whole function of our job is service, right? Is I don't know. Yeah. It's like you know, it's it's we're all here to serve, you know, and but we're not servants, you know. There's a big difference. That part. That's a it's a big difference. I am here to serve, but I'm not your I'm not a servant. That's right. Very. We talking to exactly. exactly. Um, if you all just join us, I'm talking to Amherst Jones. She is a chef, entrepreneur, and she's the new feature chef on um, Owen's new program, Food Fantasies. So I want y'all to get it going. Like y'all, leave some comments. We're gonna leave room in a little while for the questions. But um, I would love if we could pivot to your show. Um, I think you are tailor made for television. Um, oh, really? so much of, you I mean, you, well, you, you have the great communications. You understand your brand really clearly. Um, your food philosophy is very clear, and you, I mean, you are you feel media ready, but this opportunity comes at a really interesting time where I think the voice of Black chefs and chefs of color in general um, are really having a lot more expand, like the, the expansiveness of the room we have. The story tell is so interesting and you seem perfectly placed um, <laughs> to do this work. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the had you thought about sort of I mean, because again, the, the, the nature of the sort of work you do is a little quiet, right? It's not you're not the front facing element of servicing clients, right? Like that's a it's a very sort of anonymous industry sometimes, a part second right industry. And I wonder if you had thought about television, had thought about what that would look like um, before actually, this opportunity. I have. I have. Um, actually, for the last six years, I've been thinking about it. And I played with some ideas with some producers and um, everything they were presenting to me or was kind of 
it just didn't fit. It just wasn't something I would be willing to do. You know, it, it wasn't, um, it wouldn't serve me. Um, and there were like, you know, scenarios where I'm like cooking and, and I don't know, almost kind of like that, you know, the, the typical reality show type of thing they wanted to put me in. And I, I didn't want to do that. And mm. I said, my opportunity is going to come. Um, I just have to be patient. Um, yeah. Very patient and literally just like kind of just I received the phone call and I was like, what now during this time? And it was just in the perfect platform. So really fun. I've been thinking about it for a while and I'm hoping to do more of it for sure. Absolutely. So let's talk about the show. Um, so like I said, there are four original programs that um, aired last week. Um, yes. There's two fantasies and this. So talk about like the premise of the show. Um, so they um so they present these chefs or chefs um there's about four chefs per show with hypothetical like situations um so last week's show was called um if cal if calories didn't count what would you make you know and that's pretty much it's a fun show it's easy it's just something that we haven't seen um on TV in a long long time that's with a, a full cast of black chefs um so that's pretty much you know what it is and it's like a series i think it's there's six episodes i'm on two episodes i did last week's episode and i'm doing tomorrow's episode i'm airing tomorrow's episode airs at one on the own network i mean yes open with me network so and this week's episode is called um the fried hall of fame so you're gonna see okay. me um make this wild cherry hot honey truffle chicken over a garlic chai waffle um, and it's fun. It's hot like, honey, cherry, truffle. Know, it's, like, it's like a tongue twister. Wild cherry, <laughs> hot honey, truffle. <laughs> Wild cherry, yes. Hot honey, truffle yeah. Yeah. So that, that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. And, um, and I'm excited about the show. Some really great. And you're going to see some techniques from different. I love watching how everybody translates how they cook. Um, and, you know, this lovely chef last week, um, Kelly, who was on the same episode, she did um, Osprey's Oxtail over grits, mm -hmm. and she made them with, um, she took cream of mushroom soup and braised them with that, which was really interesting, because it's not your traditional way of braising right. oxtail, and I, I thought that was fascinating. Um, but I'm excited about the show, and there's, you know, three other shows. Um, Trigay's Ways, which is Chef Trigay. And she, she's on there with her two boys, and she's cooking. She has great bubbly personality. Um, and yet, um, Tanya's Kitchen as well, who's really, really awesome. Yeah, like last week she made, um, did you see what she made last week? She made those, that, that salmon with yes. the, the collard green bread. The collard green, yep. Yeah. That it's well, Tanya Holland as well, like, there's something really, I don't know if you remember back in, like, I feel like it was the early 2000s when she she and Cheryl um, Smith were on Food Network. And that kind of, like, that is so weirdly full circle that, like, of course you should have a show. Of course you of should course. be in this yes. moment sort of circling in, that, in this way that is in, on this platform that is so clear and black and fly. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it was so good. It's, it's so good. And then you have Chef Lovely, she, who's yep. lovely. She, you know, she has her show. And I'm just, I'm like, oh my goodness, three fabulous black women holding her own shows and it's being presented on national TV. I, I just love it. So yeah. I'm working on my show next. So that's right. I'll so work for sure. I would, so let's look. I don't know if you would, you should talk. I want to hear what your what a show, full show for you would be like. I mean, it would be. Very, very comfortable. It would be an easy, comfortable, um, conversational type of show. So I would be cooking with friends and just, you know, that's what it would be, you know, I think. I have another mm -hmm. one that we're in talks with that I can't really talk about. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's what kind of it would look like, you know, just something mm -hmm. really comfortable. Um, I'm in the kitchen. There's a friend in there with me and we're just chatting about and I'm, I'm recreating one of the recipes that they grew up on. So... That's what it looks like. I, I love it. Yeah, really, really cool. So I would love it if we could talk, a, I want to circle back a little bit to sort of being ready for opportunities because 
like you said, this opportunity came literally out of the blue. You were doing your own thing, especially, I don't know if it came in the midst of, sort of, in the midst of COVID or not, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I trying to like, sort of oh, reorganize. I, gotta... <laughs> I thought I wasn't ready, but I was like, you have to stay ready, you know, so you don't have to get ready. That part. Especially um, no, if, you're, if there's something that you're, you really, really strive to do, you start working on it yourself and start like putting that energy out there and, and speaking it into existence and just getting yourself ready and just be ready to say yes. And just that's, like, that's, yeah. that's the word. That's like the word of the day. Like I, I wonder because I wonder sometimes. Um, I think a lot of the conversations we've been having here have been talking through adjusting to this moment and sort of recalibrating expectations and rethinking our businesses and just sort of figuring out what in the midst of this moment um, our industry looks like, our work looks like, and I wonder. Because of the personal nature of your work, um, I wonder how you adjust it in this moment, right? Like, you sort of doing the, I'm a private chef as well, and the sort of negotiation of um, client management, it shifted a lot in the midst of. Yeah, it shifted a lot. It's been shifting a lot, and there's a lot of drop off. It's not really me going into a home and and, and cooking there all day um, because everyone wants to stay as safe as possible. So mm -hmm. a lot of it, I mean, if I were to continue to work, if work for in a private space, there would probably just one, one or two clients that would go inside the home, you know, you know, yeah. you have to be just very, so now it's just been really just a lot of drop offs, um, yeah. or pick up and deliver, you know, pick up, you know, um, I actually been, I also have a, a chicken concept that I've been doing pop ups. Um, with it's it's called Chicken Jones, and with that I've been it's literally pickup only. You know, before it would be at a, like at a place. I did them at several um, like coffee shops last year. This, this great coffee shop called Panther Coffee, and um, it was either it was dine in and, and pickup. But now it's because we're in COVID. It's, you know, if I'm at a place, I'm cooking in the kitchen by myself. They're taking orders just strictly to go. And that seems to be working. So, you know, there's been, it's been a challenge for a, a lot of cooks and chefs to just kind of like figure it out. Like, how am I going to get my product out there? How am I going to yeah. make money, you know? So. But I feel like that's one of the things too, you made this point earlier in this so spot on. It's like the dexterity of sort of that private chef catering space. It prepares you in ways that, you know, maybe, um, chefs who only accustomed to working in the very rigid restaurant maybe wouldn't be able to to have like there's a it's, even as the I mean you you're, you're sort of concierge service your event services yeah. um the event services like your business makes you sort of nimble in a way that um probably serves you really well right now. Well, but my you know the the catering you know when COVID was announced in, in was it March two weeks, like a week or two later, every event that I had scheduled, no more. So um, the ship has been challenging, but you just have to make it work. You have to just be very yeah. creative about how you work, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I want, yeah, I don't know. I feel like you you are so, your answers are so full. Um, and I feel like there were a couple of questions, but I think you answered them. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because your the your sort of personality on on camera is really infectious. And it was so interesting Aww. to watch um, all the personalities sort of be juxtaposed in that way. Um, yeah, I, just, I, I it was really surprising is the, is the wrong word because clearly anything on on is going to be beautiful. But also, right. just when black people show up and just let them be fly, it's always right. interesting. Um, they did, and they were very. Like, they just let me be me. They said, just be you. There was, like, no script, nothing. It was just, you know, and it was, it was fun. A lot of fun. Yes. Um, I feel like there's also something we didn't talk about, but something I find really interesting. You did some um, culinary ambassador work, and I feel like there's, like, you talk a little bit about that, because there's this element of, like, I feel sometimes we don't take the responsibility 
of sort of translating our food ways to other folks as seriously as we should. Like there's yeah. something so particular about the nature of this work right now where you every aspect of what we show to the public um is defining the times, it's defining our culture. Um and so you have you you got this really interesting opportunity. Um I would love yeah. to talk a little bit about that because it's so interesting. It was so interesting. It was actually I was actually on vacation in Istanbul and I, I did a, a pop up dinner at this this place called Soho House. And I did a pop-up soul event, just something really cool and different just for the members there. And from that event, there was a woman that works for the Holland Center based in DC. Um, and she met me and I, I fly back here, back home and I get a call from her. And she's like, would you fly back out to Istanbul, Turkey to teach a, a class on soul cuisine at ha Qatar Hash University? And I'm like, what? And she said, we had, <laughs> and I was like, what? You know, I'm like, you want me to teach a class on soul food in, in Istanbul, Turkey? And she said, yes. And she said, we would love for you to be the guest chef as well for our national, international ambassador meeting. So what it was is they had these peace relation talks with different countries. And um, this, this cycle was the relationship, just forging a relationship between um, Turkey and the U.S., and when they do this, they bring in a, a chef from the from that country. So I was that chosen chef from the U.S. to come in and and do this event for them, and it was just unbelievable, like just fabulous. And I taught a class, and um, and I cooked with these culinary students at um, Qatar House University. Um, and I had to have a translator there with me the whole time because none, none of them spoke English, but I was teaching them how to you know just our cuisine, and it was. It really just really something that warmed my heart and I you know we you know they touched my soul I touched their souls you know um listening to some of their stories you know um through the translator just was just really really warming um but it was a really great experience and I got to you know there was some you know being in Turkey of course I mean they had that very famous um spice market there you know I bought that spices I mean, it was like a suitcase of spices um, that I bought back. And I, I just learned a lot about their cuisine. And now, and to this day, I still incorporate a lot of those spices in my food. Actually, some of those spices are in my fried chicken that I'm kind of well known for here. Well, because I, I asked you about that because there's something really particular about, because you find your, your sort of culinary philosophy around a sort of modern soul um, narrative. And I think sometimes we, I, I don't know, I remember um, starting my site really early on and people not really wanting to embrace soul food or sort of embrace the sort of foundations of it that are in the DNA of all kinds of cuisine. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if, because there's something particular about modernizing taste and sort of traditions that we know. Um, and translating that for folks in ways that, like, your mom's spot chicken is not going to be like mine, and your, you know, right. that's sort of, the things we think we know about this food really are regional, they are personal, they change from household to household, and so I wonder yes. if you talk a little bit about crafting this vocabulary, because there is a, I feel like sometimes we, because in, in, in the absence of cookbooks that are expansive, or even restaurant concepts that um, allow for playfulness or sort of a broader definition for soul food, we maybe mm -hmm. get, we marginalize ourselves before we even get a chance to express it to other people. And you have a really global, thoughtful way of thinking about your food, your, so your, your food framework. So if you talk a little bit about I that, I would love uh, when I closed my restaurant, I had a, a gentleman that stopped me. I'll never forget this. Um, I was at a coffee shop, and he stopped me, and he said to me, Amaris, you know what I really appreciate about your restaurant is that your, your menu was just so thoughtful. He said, it only, it didn't, it played to your tradition, but in addition to that, I felt like there was something for everybody in there. And I feel like that's how we should cook, and especially if we're serving people. I'm saying always stay to your, your true tradition, but if there's something in there 
very it could be very very small to make someone else remind them of how they grew up i think it's, it's something very special um but i always you know there was a lot of cooks that kind of i've seen in interviews that like you said they you know they want to change the realm of the traditional soul food and you know they don't want to be known as soul food chefs or and but i embrace it i i embrace it um yeah yeah. I think, yeah. It's this is time to right, and it's because it's all, the other part of it. That I think is so, it's it's heartbreaking, but it's also really beautiful to watch. It's like so many think about the back in South, back in Philly, back in like all these major cities where soul food kind of was birthed. Um, these elders are passing, and there's this sort of baton pass that we need to be aware of and kind of mindful of. Um, because it's chefs like you who, who are we need to preserve it. We need to yep. preserve our the food that we love so much growing up on. We have to preserve that tradition. And you can preserve that tradition and, and make it modernize, you know, as you please, based on whatever region you are. I say, but preserve the the, the tradition, you know? Yeah. Um, as much as you can. I don't know. I just I, I it made me you know, especially when like just Watching you on the show, but also just reading your bio and sort of sort of seeing your footprint, um, it just it feels very much like you sort of have picked up this really particular baton, um, and it's doing this really really important work of define like defining for our generation what that means, what this food what this food looks like. I feel like soul food was so much about movement of people and sort of translating our blackness through food. How, what does that mean for you? It should look different for everybody. It should be we it should be um global and it should be personal but it should be clear. Like you should take the reins of your kitchen and define that so clearly. I mean so food, it was. really soul food is American cuisine. It's our cuisine. We talk yep. our ancestors talk the country I eat. Cook. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it is. I mean, it's it's that's what it is. It's period. period. Yep. Period. I, so. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> so I don't. Want, I mean, I don't know. I feel like y'all need to speak up with questions. If we don't have any other questions, I just want people to tune in on one o'clock Eastern. Um, food fan, please is uh, it's the I love the idea of so many chefs' voices being able to be highlighted on the on the one half hour. It's like you just you getting this opportunity to see and get introduced to chefs that you maybe didn't right. know before but get or, or get to see chefs that you knew in different ways. Um each show has themes. Last week's was this kind of calories don't count. And your dish last week was really interesting too. We talk a little bit about that dish. No that dish <laughs> That was, you know, that was a dish that I used to literally, every time I was on South Street, as it, as I became a young adult, um, and I was able to, like, hang out by myself and with my friends, I would literally take, you know, two buses in the subway to go get these spicy Spanish fries that were at this place on South Street. Um, and it was just something that we did. And as I got older you know, mid-20s, you know, the fries came with the margarita. And that was just kind of like <laughs> our hangout spot. And it's just something I always enjoyed. And when I opened my restaurant, I put those fries, my version of those fries, um, on the menu. So when they asked me to do this show, it's, if calories didn't count, they said, what else would you put on top of those fries? And it was something I really didn't think about. And I was like, well, maybe some meat on top of them, almost like a poutine, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So that's how they turned it to how- It was, that was giving, it was giving definite poutine vibes, yeah. It's a poutine vibe, for sure. Um, traditionally, I only just did it with, you know, jalapenos and um, and onions and shallots, and then, you know, some spicy old bay, but they're just, that is something about that jalapeno and onion and french fries, child. It's literally like having home fries. Cause we yeah. all love home fries right. for breakfast, so. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're gonna be tuning in this week to see your fried chicken recipe. Is it now? You said the the recipe that you you're like spite. You're like 
you know, Mediterranean, Indian spices, the sort of, like, the, well, that's your classic. This, this, well, this recipe is a little different. It's a little different. This recipe is a little different. Um, there is um, all spicy, which is nice. Um, okay. Really, really nice. But, um, yeah, this one's a little different. You'll see when, you, when it airs um, tomorrow. And I believe they're going to start posting the recipes on the, um, on the, on the website. So you can check there for the recipe once they post they post it after the episode air so okay everyone's gonna so, be you know, it. it's gonna be so good i, I just i, I want to just this is just me like I, I always felt like there was good like this moment is so wonderful because every cultural institution especially ones that are thinking and talking about black culture have to think about food and it feels like own sort of stepping out on faith in a lot of ways because there's I don't know if there's a lot of um you know anyway this idea of a network that thinks so clearly about black people and black women yeah. and expansive blackness um considering food as important and that storytelling is important is game changing and I just I love so much that there are so many like this block of shows to my mind is just the start and it's I hope it makes other platforms braver. Um and telling like letting black folks tell their stories. Absolutely. And I'm I'm really excited about all these other networks that are probably gonna chime in and, and hopefully do the same thing because there needs to be more black chefs seen on television and seen to the masses and you know, to the world, you know. I mean definitely yeah. we need to celebrate us and unapologetically, you know, just live in our truth and cook how we want to cook and show them why it works for us. You That's know? right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, and Mar Maris, I'm so excited about all the cool things you have. To you just, I feel like you yes, are so you. unique people. <laughs> you are so prepared for this moment. I just, we're going to watch you all kinds of media presence, all kinds. It's just, it's going to be so good. And we, uh, seriously, and so just, Please, you should be in community of Black food folks. I think we always sort of love on and take care of and support Black people, Black food creators especially, and we're going to be paying attention and watching and following. So if you are not familiar with Amaris, you should be following her page right now. You Thank should go you. to her website, subscribe <laughs> to her site, and tune in um, this Saturday um, on, on 1 o'clock for Food Fantasy. Oh, Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Yes, it was very fun. I can't wait to have you back sometime soon. And yes, yes, it's gonna be so good. Anytime. <laughs> I love it. Thank you All so right. much. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Okay, y'all. That was fun. So if y'all want to pay attention, you should tune in. Um, there's a solid two hour block on 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 Saturdays that is all food everything and very black programming. Um, we're gonna have a couple other um of own cast members um in the coming weeks, but yeah, man, we are very excited to see black chefs get in room to just be fly and cook what they want to cook and tell their stories. So it's going to be good, and I will see y'all next week.